What I do annually at these conferences, I give an overview, a very subjective overview of uh, recent cases that were decided and pending cases of the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg and the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Um, my original attempt was, instead of me presenting them, I'll give you reading materials, okay? So this is the small, small size printout of the cases I'm going to deal with today. And let me put them away. Obviously, I'm not going to make you read them. I'm going to present them to you. And that's only a selection of the cases I could have dealt with. Um, why is that the case? Uh, because, as you will see, I'm going to basically talk about what I call the leftovers of last year, because between last year's conference and this year's conference, some of the cases I mentioned last year were still in a stage of being to be decided, pending cases, and they have been, in the meanwhile, been decided. I will then look at what else is new from Luxembourg, and when I, mean Lux when I speak Luxembourg, I don't mean Luxembourg as a city, but uh, the seat of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And then I will again say, what do you have to look out for in the coming months and maybe year until we hopefully meet again next year? The pending cases, and then I will briefly talk about Strasbourg, although the latter I will only do very briefly. Why? Because a lot of the topics we will talk about in the round table this afternoon are core uh, human rights issues. So freedom of expression cases of the... Um, court in Strasbourg and uh, two of my colleagues will be talking quite a few, uh, quite a lot about those cases. Um, when I talk about um, the media law issues, you could challenge me and say, well, if he's doing an update on media law cases, what exactly does he mean? And you will see I will be talking about intellectual property cases, about what you may call information technology law, or maybe more precisely in the EU context, e-commerce law. I will briefly, but very briefly, touch data protection law unfair commercial practices. In theory, I could also present you with some cases on the institutions, because there have been some very relevant cases on the institutional powers of the European Union, which also, in a way, affect, for example, uh, policy making or the procedure of the legislation, which we discussed a little bit this morning, or external affairs. Think only of the Marrakesh Treaty, which needs oh, already mentioned in the morning. That, that there's, there's important decisions about what are the external competencies of the European Union. I will limit myself maybe to the first four issues. Why not only media in the traditional sense? Because, honestly speaking, if you look at media, you, you, you have to look at IP law. You just cannot ignore it because they go hand in hand, and I hope I will be able to present that to you. Um, focus, as I said, is going to be on Luxembourg, on the Court of Justice of the um, European Union, and it's a shame because really about Strasbourg I could have selected easily five key cases and if we had even more time, I could have also talked about 20 or 25, but I will just limit it um, to what I can present in this half hour. And also, in the previous years, I, I took some few cases which I dealt with very much in detail. This year, I'm going to do it a little bit different. I want to rather give you a broad overview of cases. So some cases I will really only touch upon, say what the most important um, uh, decision aspects are, and then hopefully, if there is still questions, I could fill them up um, in the discussion period afterwards. So if we talk about update of last year, or what was still pending last year, what has been decided, the first that you all will um, uh, maybe even think about is this very famous uh, decision in the case of GS Media. GS Media was a, um, a case involving a Dutch website and last year the opinion had just been handed down, so it was very timely, which linked to an Australian uh, website where there are files available, a file sharing website, um, and basically a lot of unauthorized files which are uploaded from God knows which sources and uh, which are made available to the general public there. And in the disputed case, it was about photos which were from a forthcoming edition of a Playboy, of the Playboy magazine, and concerned Brit Eklund, uh, uh, um, a, an actor. This was later the version of Playboy as it appeared. But the photos were available on this Australian website well before um, they were to be published, without authorization, obviously. And the 
you could maybe now say, what's Australia got to do with EU law? You're right, there's a, still the link missing. This Dutch website was basically a news website, or is a news website, one of the most popular Dutch websites, and it did like a preview. It, it described that Brit was, uh, photos were taken of Brit um, naked and that they would appear in the Playboy, and if you happen to be interested to see them, follow this link. Okay? So they, they made it relatively easy, accessible, because the original website in Australia was not that obvious to find if you didn't have a link to it. And it concerns what I would now call the eternal question of what is communication to the public, communication to the public being defined in Article 3, Paragraph 1 of the uh, so-called uh, InfoSoc Directive, the directive which harmonized certain aspects of copyright for the information society. It is um, 16 years old and, uh, as we heard, also part of the package to be reformed. The communication to the public was introduced to basically protect authors against an increasing accessibility of protected works illegally via online sharing forums. But in 2000 and 2001, when the directive was uh, designed, there were very different types of websites and sharing systems that were used. Today, as you probably all know, it is extremely easy to find any type of content, film, music, photos, um, illegally somewhere on the web. And it is not as if this was the first case. There is like a, a history of cases of the Court of Justice um, on um, the question of what is communication to the public. And it, maybe some of you uh, realize that last year, after the opinion was handed down in this GS Media case, there was another decision which was um, taken by the court, even in the Grand Chamber um, setup, in Reha Training, where, uh, or Reha Training, uh, because it was a German um, um, company, and they were discussing whether or not it is a communication to the public if you go to your fitness studio and you do your jogging and you have a, ca um, a TV in front of you where they show um, um, a TV program, whether that is actually communication to the public or not. So there is a, it's been a whole list of cases that defines what exactly is connected to communication to the public, but for us interesting is the, uh, uh, is the um, GS Media case for the following reason, because it links to illegal websites. So for example, in Rea Training, it was about a television program being transmitted within the fitness studio, and there were previous uh, um, cases where there was about music being played in a dentist waiting room. And then the question was, do people go to the dentist to that specific dentist because he's got music in his waiting room or do they go to the dentist because of their teeth? In other words, is it really something that is um, disadvantaging the original author? Here, it is relatively clear. The photos were made, very exclusive because people want uh, to, uh, that, or the, the, the photographer gets paid uh, to make nice photos and people then are supposed to buy the Playboy or use the online website of Playboy and not find it two months before it is being printed for free on another website. So the question was, is it an illegal communication to the public, not what the Australian website did, but what the Dutch website did by just linking to this website? And the, the question that, the, the, the way the court answered the question was said, okay, the, the courts that deal with these questions have to decide basically on two issues. Whether or not the linking website, in this case the Dutch website, does so because it has a, a financial uh, interest in it, pursuit of a financial gain, relatively easy to be answered with yes in this case because obviously the Dutch website attracted many users to go to their website because then they could, you know, from there find the link to the uh, naked photos and it is a website full of advertising. And the second question, whether or not the person that links, in this case the Dutch website, knew or should have known, could have known that the target website contains these photos in an unauthorized manner so illegally. So what the court has introduced in this GS Media case is to say, well, professional media services such as this Dutch, Dutch website that co collects all kinds of pieces of news and information, including the one um, that is in dispute here, has a financial gain, is professionally organized, could have easily found out that even the name of the target website suggested that this is more or less a, a source of illegal, um, illegally accessible material. Whereas maybe a general user who 
happens to have a website where they put out a link and there is no advertising on the website may be um, not subject to a violation under copyright terms. And it is interesting for the fact that the, the court is trying to find a balancing between what is happening all the time and therefore is part of uh, real life, illegal linking or linking to illegal websites and the interest of the authors to be protected against this illegal linking. And therefore, if there is basically a big organization behind it, if there is money behind it, then um, the courts should review it more strictly than if it is a private person. And as we are already talking about what I uh, now abbreviate as CTTP, communication to the public, we might as well look at uh, two cases um, which, which were um, decided or are being decided and which will continue the saga. So we are long uh, from having everything clarified with GS Media. One is uh, Stichting Brein uh, uh, versus Wollums. Uh, Stichting Brein is a Dutch association um, um, representing authors and so functions like a collecting society and Wollums was a seller of a multimedia player which is quite interesting in today's world that you still have hardware being sold in this case the film spaler as the uh, name suggests a film player um, which basically is put between your internet access and the television screen and enables access to copyrighted works um, um, also copyrighted works which are available in an unauthorized manner and the problem was that Willems, when he advertised his device, this uh, film Spieler, actually focused on exactly that. He said, with this, you can easily get access to all kinds of sources online, and uh, then you can have them on your TV. So the illegal sources, the, the, the easier access to illegal sources was advertised, and there were specific apps uploaded onto the um, film Spieler that made this possible. And that was very important afterwards for the decision. It's only a few weeks ago, at the end of April, that the court stated, is selling hardware to be regarded as a communication, because communication to the public has two elements, a communication and the public, and they said, yes, in this case, it is a communication because the hardware is not to be seen as a device, it is actually a, an enabling tool to get access to um, information which has been communicated to the public and therefore it is also to be regarded as an act of communication which is enabled with that. The second is, is it a communication to the public which is enabled by the film Spieler? Well, the public, according to the court, is if there is a large amount of people that can have access to the um, communicated content and the court here said yes, this is potentially a very wide um, um, group of people that can all have the same time access to, this, uh, to these websites. Let's imagine thousands of people buy this film spiel. That was quite um, successful. Then it certainly is similar as if it was communicated to a grand new public. The court always uses the criteria of an indeterminate number. Further, the court had developed previously the question that if there is a communication to the public of a piece of information which has already been communicated originally, so there's like a secondary communication, then the question whether it constitutes a communication to the public in the sense of the directive depends on whether it is a new public which is reached. So basically, if you um, send out a, a communication in two different technical manners at the same time, let's say via cable and satellite, it would not be a communi different communication because it's the same public that can be reached. However, if it's a new public, then the court says uh, this makes it a, 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 second, a relevant secondary communication. A new public basically means if it's a different target group than the group that was originally foreseen by the copyright holders, or if it is done in order to achieve, like as a... Um, as a, somebody who's riding on somebody else's ticket, if it is achieved for um, profit-making nature, okay? And with that, the court, with those three criteria, didn't yet come to a conclusion and therefore developed uh, some new criteria which we have to look at now um, by saying, um, in such a case as in this one, where we are actually talking about a streaming service, which means you have 
not a television program, but you have this hardware which allows you to view, for example, a movie via a streaming. Then the question was, and that was the defense of Willems, well, this is streaming is purely a reproduction for um, a technical purpose, so if, even if you get me on the communication to the public, I'm certainly not illegally reproducing the content. And the court said, no, no, the idea of reproductions of original content which do not need an authorization is limited to one case in Article 5, and that is if it is necessary for technical reasons. So, for example, if you access a website, a legal, um, legally a website, and your computer makes a temporary local copy so that you have a better um, quality access, that is regarded as a merely technical reproduction and doesn't need an authorization. So you don't have to ask the copyright holder, can I actually do that? But this type of technical means is not regarded as exempt under Article 5. Somebody has um, written a contribution titled the Ten Commandments of Communication to the Public and basically tries to list the ten criteria that you have to consider. Um, the point is not all ten are relevant in every context. So if we have a clear new public, then it's fine. If it is not so clear whether there is a new public because the, um, in this case, the sources were available. So if you would have gone via internet without the film Spela, you would have still found the sources. But the film Spela, by putting it all together for a profit-making nature, because he's advertised it to the people to buy it so they have easier access, then that is the additional criteria that we use. So it's a little bit of a pick and mix, and every copyright lawyer is hoping that the court will finally come up with one case where it can say, okay, one, two, three, four, five. These are the steps of the test. After that, you know whether it is a communication to the public or not. Are we there yet? No, we're not. The next Stichting Brian case is um, on, on the doorstep, basically, because in um, February, the Advocate General gave his opinion in, against Stichting Brian, this time against Ziggo, BV, and, and others. And it is about, um, and, and the, the AG points this out, is about a difference to the previous cases because in these cases, the breach is not in the fact that something that had already been communicated, that is, for example, available on the internet, is re-communicated, but here the um, problem is that the original communication is already the breach. Why? Because um, it, it concerns the um, website, the Pirate Bay, and the question was, if somebody uses an indexing website, so peer-to-peer, um, network, which via, for example, the Pirate Bay accesses content on other people's computers, but not in its entirety, because you probably know that peer-to-peer -peer networks work in a way that they pick out bits and pieces, these torrent networks, they pick pieces from many, many different computers and put them together again. And then the question is, who actually did the communication? Has there at all been a communication? If from every computer a small slice is being put together. And the court actually confirmed and said, yes, a communication to the public has taken place in such a case. So if you use a, a website like the Pirate Bay, there is a communication to the public. The only question is who communicates to the public? The user that accesses via the um, file share, via the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, other um, content, or the users which make the content available which in reality in those cases is the same, because if you want to participate, you open up your computer and then you get access to other um, sources. And the court basically said it's both. Uh, Pirate Bay, or any website similar to the Pirate Bay, um, is necessary for constituting a communication to the public, and they do it deliberately. They, they give access to, to content which they have not cleared or is not authorized. Um, and also the users, very clearly, because they are um, active in, 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 a, in enabling this uh, communication. For the intermediary, but in a non-technical sense, for the intermediary, in this case Pirate Bay, there is only one possibility to be exempt from having communicated to the public, and that is if they react um, and basically if, if there is a notice, there is a legal content which you are making available via your indexing website, and if they then react by blocking the access to that content, then they are exempt, which basically reflects the e-commerce directives um, liability regime. But the reality is those 
uh, file, those index indexing websites, they don't work like that. They, it's exactly the opposite of what they do. They don't um, react to a notice because they say, we are not instrumental. We are just providing the software and it's the users that are using it. What is very interesting in that case, and it's not yet decided, uh, this is the opinion of the Advocate General, uh, the way he suggests that the court decides, but we will see what happens. What is interesting is the second question, which is very important in that case um, that the um, Advocate General puts out, and that is, can a, an internet service provider whose users via that internet service provider can also access a website like the Pirate Bay, can that ISP be addressed with an injunction or with a blocking order um, to say, you ISP, although you've got nothing to do with the Pirate Bay and you've got <coughs> nothing to do with the illegal behavior of your users directly, you are indirectly making this possible and therefore we are addressing you to block access for your clients to this website. Is that possible or not? And the Advocate General says, yes, it's possible. Uh, the Article 8, Paragraph 3 of that directive allows for exactly that type of blocking orders, but it has to be subject to proportionality and some other conditions that he gives. But in principle, this means if, if authorities would like to, and there is a website that clearly allows massive violations of copyright, then they can, instead of dealing with that website, because it might be outside of their jurisdiction, they can go to um, the internet service providers in the national context and say, this, 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 and this website should be blocked. Or, what is more likely, if the rights holders go to a court and say, we want the ISP to block access, that is possible. Which <coughs> many say is technically quite an issue, and uh, a blocking order has to be usually very precise, and the uh, websites might change very quickly, so there is follow-up problems, but at least if the court follows the Advocate General, we will know in future that is possible. As if that were not complicated enough, there's another aspect, because communication to the public is not only protected under the, uh, um, in the context of the 2001-29 directive, but um, there are also exceptions mentioned. And um, then there are also other contexts where there is something similar like a communication to the public. And I will mention uh, the two of them, which uh, we, we could see as re being fitting into the same uh, context. One is AKM, uh, which is an Australian, uh, sorry, an Australian, Austrian collecting uh, society versus um, a, a, a cable network. And there is an exception in the law where local area cable networks with a maximum um, subscriber threshold of 500, basically mini small local um, communal uh, cable networks, should be more or less exempt from um, being regarded as communicating um, to, a, to a specific public. Um, what was in question was is whether the simultaneous, full and unaltered transmission of programs by means of cable is a communication or not, because it's a simultaneous retransmission. And again, the court suggests that we have to decide it along the question of whether it is a new public. And if, and that was the first part of the question, it would have only been the programs of the national public service broadcaster. The court may have accepted that it's not a new public because by definition, the Austrian public service broadcaster, ORF, has to be available to everyone anyway. And so if they're additionally available via a local cable network, there is no new public. But on the local cable networks, there were also other programs available which were not previously available or potentially not available, for example, via terrestrial networks. And that's why they said if um, new programs are involved, then yes, that is a new public. And what is interesting, 500 may not be so relevant one communal uh, antenna or one communal cable network in this case. But the fact is that there could be very many. And if you add all of them together, then you have the same thing like a massive distribution to an indeterminate number of people. And that's why, yes, the um, exemption that is foreseen in the copyright or in the InfoSoc directive for cable networks, for rules on cable networks, national rules on cable networks, does not carry an exception like the one that Austria had foreseen in its law for local cable networks with a maximum um, subscriber level of 500. So in other words, if you have such a cable network, you also have to clarify that you've got the licenses to broadcast the programs. And another one is once more a hotel 
a hotel um, case. Why once more? One of the very first communication to the public cases actually dealt with a hotel and the question whether TV sets in hotel rooms constitute a communication to the public. Hotel argued, no, obviously not, because I know who comes to my hotel rooms and who stays overnight. And that's exactly the question here, except it doesn't deal with the, uh, with the InfoSoc Directive 2001-29, but there is another directive which is relevant, and that's the Rental and Lending Rights Directive. And that also contains a provision on communication to the public. And the court is trying to establish that if there is the same concept in different directives, maybe we should use a horizontal approach in the understanding. And therefore, in this case, they said, well, um, a, a hotel room can be a communication to the public, but for the rental and lending rights directive, the communication to the public um, authorization doesn't concern the original rights holder, but it concerns broadcasting organizations. So basically, the broadcasters who put together individual copyrighted items to one program. And there they said, um, the provision expressly mentions that there has to be an entrance fee paid. And the hotel room cost cannot be regarded as an entrance fee to make it possible to watch on the TV set in your hotel room a uh, program, and that's why it is, not, um, it is not regarded to be a communication to the public in the sense of the Rental and Lending Rights Directive. There's potential for conflict here between the two directives, um, but it certainly is an interesting um, uh, move forward. It's a German collecting society versus, as you can see, a German hotel, Hotel Edelweiss. Now, we're still in the wrapping up period, but we're going to leave IP rights behind us for a moment now and just look at IT law, or mainly IT law. Two very interesting cases of last year. Both came from Germany, but this is pure coincidence. McFadden was decided in September and basically concerned open Wi-Fi networks. There was a shop owner that had uh, offered his customers, his neighbors, you can use my Wi-Fi network. It was not password protected. It was open. And the question was, if somebody then uses this network, to illegally download, for example, a, a movie, is he liable or is he not? And uh, the court discusses a lot the, the question whether there is a direct liability, answer probably no, or whether there can be some form of indirect liability, and I'm sorry that I cannot translate that. The German courts had developed, it's not written in the law, but they had developed a concept which they call the Störerhaftung, which basically says if somebody is not actually the one that is creating the violation, but he is creating a disturbance by enabling the violation, so he's giving the infrastructure in this case, then potentially he can be under a secondary liability. So if you cannot get the original violator, you get the one who gives the infrastructure. And in this case, it would have been the free Wi-Fi operator. And the court said, yes, it is okay that the German courts allow um, uh, injunctions or, or um, yeah, injunctions against providers of such networks. And the big question was, what does it mean? Does it mean everyone that has an open network has to shut it down? A court limited a little bit by saying, you, you cannot impose too strict obligations on the operator of such an open network um, as to how to avoid illegal use of it. Um, but possibly it is necessary to at least have a password protection so that at least for example, the shop owner can say, if you want to use my network, who are you? Here's the, here is the um, password to use it, but it's not um, totally open, not um, um, allowing full anonymity of the users. Now, as a reaction to this, and because this is a very, typic, a very specific German invention, which is not copied in, in other EU member states, um, uh, the German law is going to be amended in a way that the Störerhaftung basically is replaced, or at least that's the idea. Um, but the court accepted in principle that such a secondary liability is possible. And maybe just as interesting is the Patrick Breyer case, which was decided a month later in October, which finally clarified a question which was out there for a long time, and that is, are IP addresses, especially if they are so-called dynamic IP addresses, to be regarded as personal data under the Data Protection Directive? That is highly relevant, because what you can get in the internet traffic is an is a number 
of somebody accessing your website. So imagine you want to, you put out a honeypot, you've got, you want to track who is illegally accessing content, you put out a honeypot, you can register who is accessing that, but you don't actually get a name. It doesn't say Mark Cole, but it will give an IP address. Very often these IP addresses are not static, so it's not like this IP address belongs to Mark Cole, but they're dynamic, they change. However, typically, if you put that together with um, information that the ISP has, even if it's temporary, then usually an identifiability is possible and the court says, and that's why outright dynamic IP addresses are regarded as personal data. With everything that that means, because it means they fall under the Data Protection Directive and in future under the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. But at the same time, the case was a loss for Patrick Breyer because he was actually going against the German state and said, when I visit websites of German ministries, they track me. And they don't tell me that. And that's illegal. They shouldn't be able to do that. Because it's personal data, my IP address, even if it's dynamic, and because they didn't ask me. But there is a, a, an exception, which is the so-called legitimate interest exception in the Data Protection Directive. And the court said this is to be understood the way it is written in the directive. The Germans cannot impose stricter rules. And the stricter rule in that case was that you could only use data for the length of the, I simplify a little bit, for the length of the visit and whatever is needed after, because there was no contractual relationship here between the user and the ministry. And the court said no, in the legitimate interest of Article 7F, it is much more openly formulated. So there may be reasons why such data is stored beyond the visit of the website, and that's why, in a way, it was a loss for the um, applicant. I'll speed up a little bit for the um, what else is new because there's not really very much new that has currently come up, but there is one uh, case that I think is worthwhile looking at, and that is ITV Broadcasting. It's a revisit. It's already been at the court once. Um, it was decided in March, and it concerns this time not communication to the public, um, but a retransmission question. And that is that basically somebody was picking up a cable transmission of a television program and then restreamed it on the internet. And the company was called TV Catch-Up and they obviously didn't ask the original uh, program offerer whether they're allowed to do that. So they basically just said, well, it's out there free to air so we can just pick it up and then we give it on our own internet-based service to our users. And the question um, was whether the um, exception for retransmission, which we heard about also before, could also be applicable to this way of forwarding the original signal. And the court very clearly said, no, the exemptions that are defined in the directive concern cable. So the retransmission via a cable network, but not any other um, um, possibility of forwarding the signal. And this even concerns, that's important in that case, remember the ORF uh, discussion, this even concerns the fact that for example, BBC programs have to be available on all types of networks and therefore were available to the users of TV catch-up. The court said that plays no role. Um, even if the same people can consume it in this other way, TV catch-up was an illegal service which couldn't operate the way it did. An area that is very often forgotten in the context of media but is extremely relevant is the unfair commercial practices. Because the reality is that a lot of the advertising regulation doesn't happen in the AVMSD or other um, directives, but in the general unfair commercial practices directive, two brief cases. One concerns Canal Digital uh, Denmark. Um, it was about the marketing of, uh, Canal Digital Denmark did the marketing of TV program packages. So they sold it and said, if you have a subscription to our um, to our service, you have so and so many TV programs. And the problem was that, at least that was a claim in the case, they didn't really give all the pricing information that was needed. They said this will cost you monthly so and so much, but they forgot to mention that there's like a general surcharge and then there is a fee at the beginning and there's a fee if you end the um, subscription and so on. And the court said, um, when you look at whether or not something is unfair commercial practice, you always have to look at the context of the advertising, which basically means if you advertise with space limitations, you might not be able to put all the asterisks and all the explanations. Maybe it's also time limited, so you cannot have so much information on, on the little bit of time that you have for the actual advertising. But what is certainly unacceptable is that 
the split into different elements that the um, um, Canal Digital did in order to raise the price. If they do that, then they also have to communicate it. They cannot um, omit that piece of information because otherwise it is a misleading information in the unfair commercial practices directive sense. That is interesting because we heard also this morning about the uh, commission examination of the situation with the different pricing on online services, online platforms, and this definitely goes in the same direction. So users should know what the end price is of this service. Similar in the case of Thunderbolt, um, it was online this time. It was not um, um, advertising that was done also on television. It was an online advertising of dental care. And um, the Belgium law is very strict about what you're allowed to advertise as a dentist. And basically, you can give your name and that you exist, but nothing else. And he gave statement of, of his, um, of his um, patients, and, and the whole thing was relatively flashy. And the question was, is that possible, this type of online advertising, or is it an unfair commercial practice? And uh, we only have an opinion until now, um, and the opinion suggests that we have to look at the uh, e-commerce directive. So it actually should not be dealt with specifically via the uh, unfair commercial practices directive. And in the e-commerce directive, there are some issues about what is exempt. For example, public health rules from member states, they are okay. And that's why the, uh, AG su suggests it's okay to have such restrictions as long as they're proportionate. In other words, as long as they respect also fundamental freedoms. So that's also a case to look out for. What else should we look forward to? Well, there is lots. It's a long list, and therefore I'm going to just mention a few. But please take note of these. One, AVMSD related, because we had it this morning. Netflix and Apple are going against the Commission for the following case. Uh, the Commission, in a state aid case, has given green light to the German Film Support Act. The German Film Support Act, since it's been amended, says not only cinema uh, movie producers, but also on-demand um, providers can ask for support when they do new films. Okay? So, for example, if they do a House of Cards series and it is targeting Germany and using the German language, they can ask for support. But at the same time, on-demand service providers have to also contribute to the, um, um, to the German film fund. And they have to do that even if they are not located in Germany. So we have another establishment issue. You heard maybe today already several times establishment is very relevant. And the, court, uh, the, the commission said in the state aid case, this is fine. It's okay. And Netflix and Apple are not very happy, as you can imagine. They don't have a German seat. Um, and they will both now have to contribute quite significantly. Why? Because the, the level of the levy depends on how much turnover you make in the target country, in this case Germany. And in a way, this is the pre-invention of what will be in the AVMSD. But the Apple and Netflix say, well, but until now it's not in the AVMSD and that's why it shouldn't be possible. And the commission obviously was the of the opinion that this does not interfere either with secondary law or with primary law. Very interesting is uh, that Apple also mentioned and the law should have been communicated in draft form to the commission because there is an obli information obligation in the so-called TRIS system, the technical regulation information system. Um, it's a directive of 98, which has been codified in 2015 and basically says any law which is specifically created addressing information society services has to be presented to the commission in draft and cannot be enacted for at least three months until the commission has had the chance to comment on it or the member states. And if they comment on it, there might even be a time bar of 12 months. The German uh, legislator, the, the federal legislator, didn't see this as specifically targeting information society services, didn't communicate it. Should it, should it be regarded as having been an obligation to communicate, it would mean that that cannot be used, that law, against individuals. That's something that the court has developed. But to be calm, in the case of, um, sorry, it's not up yet, in the case of GM and MS, very recent case, the question was about gambling rules, I think, from Romania, which had not been communicated, and the court said in that case, no, no, they were not subject to this notification obligation. So it really has to be specific, specific rules targeting ISS. Other areas? Well, Google Island is a case which would have been super. Google Island and Google Italy versus the Italian regulator, except it was never decided. What was it about? 
The Italian regulator, the AG Com, had said, you are under the same obligation to share with us specific information concerning your advertising um, under an Italian law, even though you're not established in Italy, at least not the main establishment that's in Ireland. And it would have been an interesting question to see whether the Italian regulator, the AVMS regulator, that also takes care of advertising, can grab hold of Google even though they're sitting in Ireland. The problem was it was uh, declared inadmissible by the court. Why? Because the referring court had basically not given any information. They just asked the question and, and there was no substance to it and the court said we're not going to deal with it. But that means we might see the question come up again in future with more arguments. A very interesting case, but very technical, that's why I can't give you very much detail, it's the opinion is already 50 pages long or so, is about frequencies. Per Sidera, a very, very recent case, it's about Italy, and I would like you to read this quote. Advocate General Cocot has underlined something that we will hear in a moment at our round table. Fundamental importance of media pluralism and integrity in a free democratic society cannot be emphasized enough at the present time. So that's the first opening statement that she makes. And then it's about the Italian rules on the transition from analog to digital. And to, to cut the story short is basically the main, the incumbent players were always ad given advantages in Italy in the transition period, not last under the former Berlusconi government. And it happens to be that some of the profiteurs were uh, companies which he owned. And there are several cases already which have um, uh, declared that this was illegal. But this case is about if you do a transition and you use the amount of analog frequencies to calculate how many digital um, frequencies should be allocated, then you have to do the same for all size of operators, not only for the large operators as it was the case there. Except if there were a legitimate object, which Cockot says is not the case here. My next slide, I'm only going to call up. I'm not going to go through it in any detail. Why? Because data protection cases, I could do one, two, three, four, five, six, and those were only the most relevant ones. And this is not about data protection. I want to just mention two. One is communications. We will hear about that tomorrow morning. E-privacy. The question of whether communication data can be retained or not is the famous data retention case of 2014. It returned in the Taylor 2 case in December. The court still says it's a fundamental right violation if there is a blank retention of communications data. And the next one is already pending, the one in the middle, criminal proceedings, um, which will also deal with how long data can be retained or in what um, amount of depth. And the second is um, the Wirtschaftsakademie case, because that is about, again, an establishment issues and what powers data protection authorities have in that case to act against Facebook, which is not located in Germany. And there are several other cases which will be worthwhile, but I just put them on the slide because I want you to understand data protection cases very often have an impact for media. That leaves me with just one last case. And that's Strasbourg. And this kind of hurts me because I was thinking about how many Strasbourg cases do I do? And then I said, I can't do much, otherwise I would be talking too long, but I do want to do one, and the rest I will leave to the round table. The one I'm going to talk about is about an NGO in Hungary, uh, Magyar Helsinki Bizotzak. I hope I'm saying it more or less right. It was decided by the Grand Chamber last November. It's about whether or not an NGO has the right of access to information held by the government. They did some research on how criminal defense works in the country and they requested some information which would have been the names of the public defenders which had been assigned to certain cases. In a way, this is a kind of a new way of journalism. It's data journalism. They want to have access to data. Think of the WikiLeaks cases. Then they, 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 um, they mine through that data and then they give a, a report about it. And Article 10, according to the court, includes the right um, of access to information as long as it is linked to the use of freedom of expression. And the court says the topic they want to know about, who is defending cases, how often, so how often do these public defenders get cases allocated is a matter of public in interest. And the research would only have made sense if they have the names. They couldn't give anonymized data because if you don't know who it is, they cannot make their statistical research. And that's why even though personal data was concerned, the court said it's absolutely clear that the refusal by the Hungarian government to give 
any type of access to this information was a clear violation of Article 10 because it was not necessary in a democratic society, not proportionate. And in the same manner, we will afterwards hear there is a numerous cases where journalistic activity, or in this case, the activity of an NGO which resembles journalistic activity is covered by the European Court of Human Rights understanding of Article 10. With that, and I know I've been talking A, a bit too long, but B, also given you a very, very broad overview, which couldn't go into much detail, I will close. If there's any question now or otherwise later in the coffee break, I'm available. Thank you very much.